Good day to all of you who are watching this program, the second in the series, Know Your Church. After the introduction to the Catechism we have had previously, it is now time to move on to the first topic in the content. In this episode, we will get to know how God reveals Himself to mankind, what role the Bible plays in these revelations, and of what significance the Bible is to us today. In the beginning, when God created man, they lived in each other's presence. After the fall into sin, however, man was separated from God. Human beings on their own cannot perceive the nature of God and His will. As a sign of God's love for mankind, He then used other means to reveal His divine nature, as well as His will, and divine truth. So how did God reveal Himself? Well, firstly, God revealed Himself to man as the Creator. The visible creation bears witness to the existence of God, the Creator, as well as to His wisdom and power. We read in Psalm 19 verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Secondly, we also see God revealed Himself in the history of Israel. In His relationship with the people of Israel, who He had chosen as His people, He revealed Himself as it is recorded in the many incidents in the Old Testament. Most importantly, God revealed Himself in His Son. God's incarnation in Jesus Christ is in history a self-revelation that goes beyond anything else that had happened before. And lastly, God reveals Himself in the Church. With the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem on Pentecost, God revealed Himself as a triune God. This saw the birth of the Church of Christ, and insights of the Holy Spirit were imparted to the Church through the Apostle ministry. With the words in John 16, verse 12 to 14, Jesus Christ promised His apostles that they would receive further explanations about God's plan of salvation through the Holy Spirit after His return to the Father. The early apostles experienced this activity of the Holy Spirit in the same manner that the Lord had announced to them. The preaching of the apostles of Jesus active today is based on the statements of Holy Scripture. They are also guided by the Holy Spirit in their teaching commission. It is in this manner that the aforementioned promise of the Son of God is also fulfilled today. The Holy Spirit keeps alive the self-revelation of God manifested in Jesus Christ, brings it to life in the present, and points to the appearing of the returning Christ. The birth Death, resurrection, and return of the Son of God are at the center of this revelation today. Beyond that, the Holy Spirit imparts to the apostolate new insights about God's activity and plan of salvation, which, although referred to in Holy Scripture, have not yet been fully revealed. An important example is the teaching that salvation can also be attained by the departed. On the basis of his teaching authority, it is incumbent on the chief apostle to proclaim such revelations of the Holy Spirit and to declare them as binding doctrine of the new apostolic church. Now, moving on from there, we know that the human experiences of God's revelation and of his acts through the course of history of salvation have been recorded in writing. These writings were already from the 9th century referred to as the Bible. This comes from the Greek word biblia, meaning books or scrolls. God made use of humans with writing ability who, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote down that which needed to be passed on. The contents of the biblical books have their source in the Holy Spirit, but have the style, expression, and will perceptions of those who wrote them.
In our understanding of the Bible, we can therefore in summary say, the Bible is inspired by God, but it is not a complete account of God's works. Not each word has been dictated by God, but it contains all the insights necessary for attaining eternal fellowship with God. Let us for a moment briefly focus on the content and structure of the Bible. The intention here is not to go into great detail, but to highlight certain interesting facts. The Bible is comprised of two main parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament time spans more than 1,000 years and the New Testament period 70 years. The Old Testament contains accounts of the creation, individual events from the time after the fall into sin, as well as the history of the people of Israel. In addition, it contains books of wisdom, hymns and prayers like the Psalms and the words and activities of the prophets of God. What is very important to note is that as much as a third of the Old Testament is written in poetry, as such it is symbolic and metaphoric with imagery and figurative language. What this means for us is that these parts written in this style cannot be taken as literal fact. The New Testament testifies of the new covenant which God initiated with the sending of His Son. It contains the records of the activity of Jesus and His Apostles and letters from the Apostles to the congregations and to individuals. This provides insight into congregational life and the missionary activity in the early Christian period. In the final book of the New Testament, the prophetic book of Revelation, Jesus admonishes His church in various ways, comforts them with the promise of His return and points to the future events. What is important to note here is that the writings in the New Testament are authentic records of real events. Only the book of Revelations is written in a figurative and symbolic style and should be understood accordingly. When we consider the books of the Old Testament, we see that in the New King James Version of the Bible used in the English-speaking world, the Old Testament can be divided into three groups. Historical books, of which there are 17, doctrinal books, 5, prophetical books, 17. In the New King James Version of the Bible, the New Testament can be divided into the same categories as the Old Testament. Historical books, of which there are 5, doctrinal books, 21, prophetic books, 1 which is Revelation. Both the Old and New Testaments testify of God's plan of salvation for mankind. Now concerning the Bible, we may want to quickly explain two more things. The meaning of the word canon and the apocryphal books. Many of you may have heard people referring to the books in the Bible as canonical books. The term canon in English means standard or guideline and is used to describe the collection of holy writings that have been binding on all Christendom since the middle of the 4th century. No church created the canon, but churches and councils gradually accepted the list of books recognized by believers everywhere as inspired by God. The 39 books which is the Christian canon of the Old Testament, are based on the Hebrew canon of Judaism. Even in the time of Jesus and the early apostles, Judaism did not yet have a firmly defined canon. There was a basic collection of holy writings, but there were also other books which were accepted as holy by some groups, but rejected by others. The scope of the Hebrew canon was conclusively defined by the end of the first century AD. To this day, 
there is no uniform canon of the Old Testament that is binding on all Christian churches. For the early Christian congregation, today's Old Testament was the actual Bible. The recorded words of the Lord were soon held in special regard and passed on verbally. Even before any accounts of Jesus' activity were ever recorded in writing, the congregations had various creeds and hymns in which the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ were professed. The oldest early Christian writings handed down to us are the letters of Apostle Paul. These were read aloud in the divine services and then passed along to neighboring congregations. After the epistles of Paul, the Gospel of Mark is the oldest written testimony of Christian belief. The content and structure of the Gospels according to Matthew and Luke are closely related to it. In order to preserve the apostolic tradition and distinguish it from false doctrines, it became necessary to prepare a collection of New Testament writings that would be binding upon the Church. An Easter letter from Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria, dated from the year A.D. 367, lists all 27 writings of the New Testament as binding. This canon was ultimately ratified by the synods of Hippo Regius, A.D. 393, and Carthage, A.D. 397. Let's, however, be clear on this. The Old and New Testament canons did not come into being on account of human contemplations alone, but most of all through the will of God. Between the time of the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were holy writings that came into being. These are contained in many editions of the Bible and are also known as Apocrypha, which means hidden scriptures. In terms of content, these later writings of the Old Testament, or Apocrypha, are an important link between the Old and New Testament scriptures. In the New Apostolic Church, they are just as binding for faith and doctrine as the other books of the Old Testament canon. The New King James Version of the Bible places these books between the Old and New Testaments. There are 15 apocryphal books. We have now briefly discussed the content and structure of the Bible, so let's take this further and consider the significance of the Holy Scripture for the New Apostolic Church. Firstly, the Holy Scripture is the foundation for the doctrine of the New Apostolic Church. Accordingly, the proclamation of the Word in the Divine Services is based on it. It is the starting point and foundation for the sermon. Secondly, the correct understanding of the Holy Scripture can only be opened up in all its depth through the activity of the Holy Spirit, referred to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10 to 12. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1, the apostles of Jesus are also commissioned to interpret Holy Scripture. They can only do this through the Holy Spirit. Lastly, according to Christian understanding, the principal aim of the Old Testament is to prepare the way for the arrival of the Messiah. So, the Old Testament must be interpreted on the basis of Jesus Christ, for it is fulfilled in Him. Jesus Christ is the center of the scripture. Thus, even the significance of the Old Testament writings is determined by their agreement with the teachings of the gospel. In conclusion, let us then consider our personal use of the Bible. Firstly, since we believe that the Bible contains all the insights necessary for retaining eternal fellowship with God, we read the Bible to provide us with guidance in this striving. Secondly,
We use the Bible as an aid in instruction and read it to gain more in-depth insight into who we are and what we believe. Then, we also consider the Bible as a storehouse of wonderful stories which reflect the experiences humans have had in their relationship with God. This serves as a motivation and provides new courage as we go through the circumstances of life. The Bible is also a source of standards for our conduct. It gives us guidelines for knowing right and provides a moral compass for our daily life. It is thus recommended that every believer read from Holy Scripture regularly as it comforts, provides orientation and serves to promote knowledge. The important thing in this process is the attitude of heart with which the reader reads the Bible. The striving for the fear of God and sanctification, together with sincere prayer for correct understanding, are contributing factors to profitable reading of the Bible. We have come to the end of this episode where we have explored how God revealed and still reveals Himself and how we should understand and approach the Bible. So, continue to reflect on this until we meet again and you have the next opportunity to know your church. Till then, God bless.